2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. everybody this is your dfs army daily dispatch bold calls whatever you want to call us this is your mlb preview for 2019 and boy do i have a special guest for you guys today joining me is my good friend mr alan medlock from the podcast meet me at the usual he is a cardinals blogger he is a podcast uh espressionado he is an all-around baseball guy, and when I have a question about how guys are looking or if I want a second set of eyes, this is the man locally that I go to. Alan, what's up, my brother? Not much, man. Thank you for having me on. I don't know how special <laughs> I don't know the guest will be, but I'll, I'll do my best, so I uh, appreciate the introduction. Well, anytime that I can get uh, either one of our listeners not listening to just us and we can kind of branch out... Um, I think it's actually kind of special. So uh, it's a different cool. insight, especially for the guys that have been listening to me for the last two years. Um, it's different, uh, a voice to either add credence or more skepticism to things that I say. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, for those of you that are thinking that this is going to be, you know, fantasy focused today. It is not. I hate to bust your bubble. Now, what this is going to do is give you an overall view of the season as a whole. Um, it's going to basically allow you to get an insight of guys to look out for that maybe you don't know, names that you've never heard of, guys that could be making bounce back spots in new, in new places. Um, a lot of good stuff like that, uh, that can kind of help you get prepared for opening day on Thursday. So that's the big thing. Alan, um, why don't you go ahead and tell them a little bit about what you do, where you're, fr uh, where you're from and your, uh, background a little bit as far as the baseball world is concerned. Yeah, no problem. No, I've, uh, I grew up here outside of Tulsa in, uh, about 30 miles east of Tulsa, come from a baseball background. My dad, Pitched a little bit of college ball here in the uh, in the area, and uh, we it's just you know it's in our blood in our family. I followed it forever. Um, after school, after college, I went to uh, I went to Northeastern here in uh, Oklahoma, and uh, and you know I've just it's been a, it's been my passion. So study, you know, read up and uh, watch as much as I can. We, uh, I started writing for the Redbird Daily about three and a half years ago, and that was a, a startup blog that was here in town. That had le that led into a uh, a weekly podcast, uh, Meet Me at Mutual, that uh, I co-host every week. It's a weekly show. Uh, we we go over the ins and outs of of the Cardinals weekly. We do a lot of the NL Central, um, and I kind of break that stuff down, but. Uh, but yeah, has had since transferred into uh, the Cardinals Conclave. It's a big, it's a huge Cardinals blog uh, based out of St. Louis, and uh, and uh, is run by actually the co-host of uh, of the show, Daniel Shoptal. So he and I uh, get to break stuff down weekly, and um, you know, it's really like I said, it's Cardinals focus, NL Central focus, but that rolls into the uh, in the National League as well. But by no means am I. Uh, you know, blind to the American League. So I'll try to break things down as best I can and uh, and see if I can help you guys out. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of the things that, like we were talking before, um, we really, really try to focus on is not just, you know, um, something that is, is strictly fantasy related. Uh, I love talking baseball and uh, we've got, you know, similar backgrounds uh, when it comes to, 
um, how we look at things as far as baseball is concerned. We talk um, a lot during the baseball season. Uh, obviously, you know, we do personally have a history together uh, as far as baseball is concerned. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I asked you on is, is I trust your opinion, especially when it comes to uh, the NL Central. Uh, I trust your insight as far as, uh, you know, how the league and how the game is actually played and, and concerned. And, um, you know, you know, you know, the, the numbers as well. I mean, that was something that I, I really uh, we started talking about it a couple years ago, getting into uh, the actual analytical part of the sure. game um, and. And I know that when I first started doing that, when I was getting into my industry, you helped me out a lot, uh, finding out different places to look and stuff like that. So um, that's a big, big key. Uh, I know for me is since I trust and respect your opinion, um, I know that a lot of not only my listeners, but your listeners as well, hopefully, can gain some insight and knowledge um, with some of the other aspects of, uh, you know, the rest of the the um, league as well so sure well, i appreciate it i try to i tried to i try to meld or uh you know meld the you know analytical side with you the feel side as i like to say it uh the best i can you know some guys are much more in depth than i am and some simply that stuff is over my head you know i mean i i scratched the surface with some of the new age stats but some of the other ones are pretty deep i try to to uh try to follow along and, and uh and stay on top of this stuff the best i can and try to come up with my own conclusions on that. So, yeah, you'll probably get a little bit of both. I, I'm sure some of the listeners are, are much more advanced than I am of, of breaking some of those things down on the analytical side. But I have a pretty good feeling, you know, just, uh, you know, like I said, I can smell the dirt a little bit, as I like to say. So. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, you know, and that's something that, you know, we both kind of bring into it is, you know, we not only um, know the numbers, but we also trust our eyes as well. And uh, that's an argument that I will have pretty much the whole baseball season with some of our uh, some of our members that, you know, go strictly by the numbers because I mm -hmm. do know what to look for. And just like you do, and we trust our eyes as well as the numbers. So um, if there's something that's weird that the 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 eyes are showing us, we'll back it up by the numbers. If there's something that we're seeing that the numbers haven't quite shown yet, then uh, we know when to apply that as well. So uh, let's get to it here. Um, basically this is, uh, <laughs> this is my third MLB season with our, with the DFS army. Um, and it's, uh, it's, we're the biggest that we've ever been. I know this is going to be your second season writing, uh, consistently and blogging. And, uh, I think it's, you guys were on the show all last season as well, right? Uh, yeah, we actually... Asked. Yeah, we started at the uh, – let me see if I got my dates right. I, I believe it was January of 17. I believe I may be wrong on that. It's either – I may be off – uh, I may be off a full year, to be honest with you. I'm not real sure. But, uh, yeah, we're going on, uh, you know, basically, you know, year and a half at least. No, two years at least. Yeah, I know when uh, I uh, – I wanted to hear you guys' takes on the, the Goldschmidt um, signing, which we'll get into sure. uh, here in just a little bit. But I wanted to get your guys' takes on that. So I'm, I noticed that you guys were on it like episode 109. Yeah. So that was that was nice um, that you guys have been around a while. And uh, it's, it's really, really something that, uh, you know, I, I enjoyed your show. Um, I really did. So. Cool. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've got a we we have a pretty loyal following for uh, being a uh, a non media based podcast. You know, we've got you know you see Derek Gold and some of those guys in St. Louis that just have huge numbers. Well, and Dan McLaughlin. You know, I mean, yeah. of course he he broadcasts for the team, so he has that Fox Sports Midwest backing. But but we try to do what do what, what we can. We try to make some educated guesses. We've made some inroads on some sources here and there. But uh, but yeah, we just try to uh, maintain and tell it like it is, and you know and uh just kind of have fun with it yeah exactly that's that's the big thing is if you're not enjoying it then you probably shouldn't be doing it when it comes <laughs> to this uh this line of work because it can be a little bit tedious so uh man i'm i'm excited about this season uh and not only because i think that the 
um, National League. We're both National League guys. Um, not that I just think that the National League is going to be probably the best overall top to bottom that it's been in a long time, but mainly because it's going to be it's going to be a dogfight, man. Um, I, I I know you can kind of look at a lot of these divisions like we're going to uh, in the American League and kind of pick out you know who the top one or two teams are going to be. Um, but in the National League, it could go in a lot of these divisions. It could go a number of different ways. And when we get into the dog days of August and, um, you know, before the last, you know, playoff push, it's going to be one of those things that's going to it's going to be really exciting to watch and break down and see exactly how teams are positioning themselves going into the final months. Um, but as far as opening day, man, uh, Thursday, first off. This is the second year in a row that they've done it on a Thursday. And I don't know about you, but for me, I miss opening days being on that Monday, that first Monday in April. Sure. I miss it. And nothing's ever going to replace that. Um, you could kind of set your calendar. I don't know. It, it made for a weird schedule the first seven to 10 days because you would play a game and then have a day off and then yeah. play two more games and then have another day off. And it was just weird like that. But, um, man, to have it open up on a Thursday at the end of March, I know why they did it, but it, it still doesn't hold the, the significance that I, the first Monday in April did. No, I, I agree with that. And it's, you know, last year I was a little bit excited about it. I was like, okay, now we don't have the first of the week. Let's see how it goes midweek. Because I, I, I didn't really like when they were doing the special games on Sunday. And then you turned around and you had the full-blown uh, opener on Monday. I felt like that was a little bit of a reach. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, we knew where they what they were trying to achieve by that last year was kind of cool just because it was that, Hey, this is the end of the week. You hit Thursday, you got Friday, you know, you're moving into the weekend and, and you got baseball the whole time. And they would do that. The opener off day, then kind of go from there. And then the weather was atrocious last year. And I thought that was bad. You know, it was, it was, uh, um, historically cold, which I thought kind of took away from it a little bit. Uh, it honestly in April, end of March and first of April, there was just kind of some bad baseball, this year, um, I, I agree with you because I, something has happened on the schedule that, that drives me insane. I like the opening on Thursday if you can maintain games. That's what Monday could do, and I know that's what you meant. You're going to have your periodic days off. One thing I think should be against the law are Friday off days, and I cannot stand that teams have them. Um, yeah, exactly. That's, you know, in a sport that all we've heard since the end of – end of the world series till now is how they're trying to bring in younger viewers and they're doing things on the field to, to try to do that. I wish they would leave that alone. And then I, they would address the, the issues like this of, you know, the late night playoff games, or you can scratch the surface of eliminate the Friday off games. I don't know that it, it drives me insane. I just don't understand why they would uh, feel they would have to do that. I don't, it's, there's not much difference between a Thursday and a Friday. And I can't, I don't know. I would, it would take some convincing to tell me why they would have to wait for the Friday off games. It, 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 it drives me insane. When I saw those on the schedule when they were released last year, that was the thing that stuck out to me. So to eliminate that, I do like that you're rolling in from Sunday night and you're ready to go Monday and just start a full week. I, I kind of feel that way a little bit better. I, uh, last night some of the guys and I were talking about, um, not to kind of get off the baseball, but, uh, I, I like how the NCAA tournament has done it now to where they stagger their games on Sundays. And it used to be they would all, you would miss so many games because they would all play them within that 11 to 3 o'clock window to where they would be done before 60 minutes started because that's when all the CBS, because all the games were on CBS at the time. Mm hmm. Yeah. I like the fact I like the fact now that they've opened it up to those other networks, and I know that some people you know question why is it on True TV and all those. And this is not a plug for the CBS Broadcasting Network by any means, but they've done the right thing by spreading those games out. What I would really like to see though is you get that last game at ten thirty eleven. You go to work and you know try to cut out by noon on Monday to watch uh, opening day. That would be pretty nice, but now you got to wait a few days, and I didn't really think about that till this morning. I was like, boy, it would have been really nice to turn around after having a weekend of, uh, you know, your 
your heart racing from sports to turn around into the pageantry at op- opening day would be pretty nice. So, so yeah, I agree with you. I, uh, I thought that it was uh, kind of a cool gimmick last year, and I understand that they're trying to stretch the schedule out. But, uh, but you're right. It's kind of nice when everybody opens on the same day. I kind of wish they, they would get back to that. Yeah, I, I, I really do too. So, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and recap the winner here. Um, this has kind of been a trend over the last couple seasons and, when it comes from a business aspect um, and what the GMs and the owners are doing, I see exactly what they're doing and how mm-hmm. they're doing it. Um, the players recently over the last – you saw it a lot more this winter than you have the last couple winners, but they're really lashing out, um, and I it, they're lashing out at the CBA and exactly what it's kind of caused um, and how the market moves so slow – during the winter and then all of a sudden we get you know seven to days seven to ten days out from opening day and the market starts moving again um when you've got guys like bryce harper and uh manny machado basically not signing with their teams until halfway through spring training that's bad and in my opinion that's really really bad those guys we used to get the the top tier flight free agents you know signed the first second week of December and mm-hmm. they knew what they were doing going into Christmas. Now we don't get that. And that's not something that, that is, is really good. I think for the game, but going into it, it's what it's caused is this rash of extensions. Now the last week of spring training. Um, I, I think it not only was the signing of Bryson, and Manny in there, but you had the extensions coming with uh, the starts. It, it basically it started with Nolan Arenado out in Colorado, uh, where he signed the eight-year, you know, two hundred and eighty-six million dollar uh, extension to stay in Denver. And then you had the big one, um, Mike Trout, and that was after Manny and and Bryce signed. But then you had Mike Trout. Now you're getting guys basically with no service time whatsoever or very, very little service time, like Elo Jimenez, Mm -hmm. basically signing for $50 million just so they don't have to worry about getting toyed around from MLB to um, AAA on their service time. This is going to cause some issues, I think, and I'm never one. I don't care how good of a prospect you are. I'm never one that's been really – for giving big contracts out to guys that have never proven themselves. I see why they're doing it. I just don't like it. And I don't think it's good for the game. Well, and that's, I thought, I thought the Bregman extension was interesting in the same way, you know, because he, he's one of those, he could probably break the, break the bank if he would have waited out his arbitration years and whatnot. Not like he did poorly now, but uh, you know, at his, it did, you know, the way that he, has taken off and has shown the league that he belongs. It, uh, I felt like he could be one that, that, uh, may have undercut himself a little bit, but I think there's a little bit of, of certainty on that. I think a lot of those two, those two lead to a couple of things to me. I think that in this next CBA agreement, I, th- one of the big things are going to be the service time adjustments. I think they're probably going to cut back a year just because these guys are now, <laughs> you know, under their seven years after signing. The, the clubs are, are rushing them through and they're getting them for minuscule numbers until they have to pay them, you mm-hmm. know, and then uh, what happens is you get into the situation to where, hey, the, the track records for these 30 plus guys aren't 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 great. So we're willing to to roll the dice on this and let player a walk and let's see what we else we can get in uh, in the pre arbitration guys or through arbitration. And it, 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 it's a little bit troublesome. Um I, it, it's funny how things change, you know, uh, the game kind of cleaned up a little bit in, to, in the ster- during the, uh, after the steroid era, post steroid era, I guess you could call it. And to where, you know, 33, 34, 35 signings, that was, that was pretty normal, you know, and, and even before that a little bit. So we really don't know how deep things went back then. And, and it, that's, I don't even want to get into those things, but, right. uh, but yeah, it, it's funny. It, that's one of the things that I think it will be brought up is I think it's going to be the service time manipulation, um, maybe cut back a year on, uh, on player control, you know, the serve. I, I, 
I think that the Blue Jays probably caught a break. I know this sounds stupid. Oh, boy, by uh, Yeah, by uh, by Vlad getting hurt, you know, because I don't think they had any intention to bring him up. I think they were probably going to use defensive skills as, as the reasoning behind that. But he get hurt, gets hurt, and now you probably, you know, you, you're he's going to be down for a little while, and they, it's probably going to be justified for them to leave him down there. But those are going to be at the forefront. You know, some of those guys, you know, whenever it happened to Chris Bryant, who's usually a quiet, reserved guy, and he brings it up that, hey, I knew what was going on and wasn't necessarily happy with it. Those are the voices that are going to make bring ch- bring change about. I think it's probably going to start on the grassroots level like that. I think they're probably going to mess around with some some things to see um, how they could probably – make the winter meeting special again. I mean, the last three years have kind of been boring and that used to be where all those players signed. And now anymore, it's, it's, it's more of a waste of time. I mean, the rule five draftees and stuff like that don't, you know, they wouldn't appreciate me saying that, but things have just slowed down. You know, there is yeah, no exactly. hot anymore. And I, and I think that they're going to probably have to reevaluate how those things will go. I was really nervous when you hear players talking about, Hey, there may be a walkout mid season, you know, if things don't, don't play out. Well, then you see the two big names sign and all of a sudden it kind of tempers a little bit. Then you hear they're going back to, uh, back to the drawing board and how they're going to, uh, a kind of mess with the game a little bit, which for better or worse, I'm not real sure yet. But I think that there's going to be contractual things like we've talked about that, that will get changed to, to maybe speed up the process a little bit more. I hope that's the case. I don't, in this day and age, I just don't like the idea of, of work stoppages. I mean, it's just not very good. I mean, they, they had the, uh, they, they, yeah. you know, it took the home run race to bring them back in 98 because they were on thin ice back then, you know, after the 94 strike. And I just don't think the pro sports, it's just a bad look overall. And I hope they go back to the drawing board and get things done. And I'm fairly confident they will. Yeah, I think they will too. They're going to have to give some concessions on some of this stuff that Manfred is wanting to do as far as, Uh, speeding up the game and stuff like that. And that's actually going to lead us into um, our next kind of topic here before we start breaking down uh, these teams and these divisions is, uh, you know, some of the, some of the difference in the rule changes that's going to be hitting that we've heard of. Um, For me, I don't mind a lot. I like, I love the fact that they're only going to expand to 28 next year. When it comes to September baseball, I love the fact that they're expanding one extra, um, you know, player as far as the regular season. So they're going from 25 to 26 and then they'll go from 26 to 28 in September. Mm -hmm. Um, The one that I can't stand and I I, there's there's I I honestly don't think that there's a way that I can be sold on it the way it's currently constructed is the pitcher has to face three batters. Yeah, like it, it just. It, it there's so many different things that could like that can happen. You know, a lot of people brought up the fact of, you know, maybe, you know, pitchers faking injuries and stuff like that to only face their one. Yeah. Um, I'm not so much worried about that because nobody wants to look like, and, and excuse me for dropping this, but nobody wants to look like a pansy. Mm. Um, and, I understand there's gamesmanship and stuff, but I'm I'm more worried about okay, you've got a lefty coming in to face, you know, Bryce Harper and there's uh, a righty behind him. He gets Bryce Harper out, he all of a sudden intentionally walks the next guy, you know, to get to the lefty on the other side. Um you know, our, our that's it's, and that's just one scenario and one situation, but then you've got a, a situation with, okay, if the guy finishes an inning, which he has to do, but faces um, the, the leadoff hitter the next inning, that's a lefty, and then there's a righty coming in, does he get to come out because he finished an inning, or does now that he started the next inning, does he have to face two more batters? Like, there's so many different ways mm-hmm. that this could end up backfiring on MLB, um, and it's... No, I agree with that. And, and, and for some reason, that's the one that I still am not convinced was is ever going to happen. And the reason I say that, and I know that it was the proposal that the, we'll start go in the start of next year. But when I first heard that rule, when it first came out, and you know the the universal DH was brought up, the three pitcher uh, minimum was brought up, I jumped on that one and thought that could be pretty cool. The reason I said that is because. 
with us trying to, to, to I say us with baseball trying to bring in new viewers and all kinds of stuff. The one thing that does bother me is I there were times I thought I think there's paralysis by analysis and the multiple pitching changes in uh, in an inning can really grow boring to a viewer. Mm-hmm. And that was my one concern. I was like, okay, this could kind of help the flow a little bit. Well, when I stepped back a little bit and I took the two, the, the ten thousand foot overview look, I thought, you know what, La Russa did this before it was publicized. You know what I mean? I was looking at, <laughs> I was at, looking at pitching changes with the White Sox back in the day, back in Oakland, and definitely in St. Louis. And I thought, you know what, he played with these rules more than anything. So I looked a little bit further into it, and. uh and then I started thinking, you know, I understand that this is one of those that I think this is the minimalist effect because I think it's kind of a dying breed anyway. But one of the reasons I think that uh, it's probably not going to stand is A, it had been used before, and that may just be a hot button topic where they would change it. But I just cannot see the union eliminating something that's going to cost jobs. That's why I, that's probably the overriding opinion why I think the, why we're going to get the universal DEH before it's taken away completely is jobs, simply. And I think that you're going to hear that a little bit by just that, the specialist lefty. I think that that may slow the process down about where they, they go with this. Uh, I, it's going to take some convincing for me to see that implemented in 2020. I really am, but just for the reasons that you said. And the reason that I think that it's just overlooked now and it actually has been used in the past more than, than we want to admit. Yeah, exactly. It's just, you know, one of those one of those things like the union's never going to agree to something that's going to end up costing people yeah. jobs. And, you know, some people say, well, you know, yeah, it's going to cost the lefty specialist jobs, but we're adding another, you know, major league roster spot. There's 30 more jobs that are going to be available. Yeah, except for the fact that now, you know, you've got those left-handed relievers that, you know, have the horrible lefty-righty splits that – and there's a lot of them out there. You're you're talking maybe 30, 40 guys that have jobs now, and they're not expensive jobs, but they are jobs. You know, guys on the back end of their careers, guys that um, are, you know, guys that are haven't – quite developed the ability to get right handers out um, or starters that they're bringing up that are extended that, you know, are just trying to get them some acclimated to the major league, uh, you know, lifestyle stuff like that. That's not going to be something that the CBA or the, uh, the union is really going to want to want to talk about. And it, like, I think if anything pushes back, out of any of these things that uh, Manfred's trying to unilaterally implement, um, I think this is the one that could cause the most stir. Um, and, like, make no mistake about it, Manfred is – he likes the game and everything, but he's, you know, he's in, he's paid by the owners. So there's going to have to be some concessions here mm-hmm. and um, – it's it's going to be interesting to follow these along. So yeah, I think and you know just to kind of finish up, I think there's a long way to go before some of this gets put in. You know, to where you know, we were thinking that there's going to be major changes next year. I'm just not convinced that's going to be the case. Yeah, I, I don't think it is either. Um, I think Manfred kind of put this out to to say, hey, you know what? Here's a heads up. Uh, you know, with all the Hubble Hubble or you know the the backlash and stuff about the contracts and free agency. Okay, here's a heads up. You know, now I've got something on the table to where, you know, we can kind of play this back and forth in the media. So, um, okay, some hot topics in today's game that actually apply to this season and on the field. Uh, last couple of years, we've seen launch angle kind of take over the ability to, um, you know, it's it's caused strikeouts to go up. Well, I, I think there's more than just strikeouts, but um, – or more than just launch angle to this cause that to go up, but you've seen mm-hmm. the increase of you know home runs, uh, supposedly in a clean game. We're just going to assume that it is right now. Uh, you've seen the increase of home runs. You've seen the uh, increase of or the decrease of batting average as well for a lot of these guys. You have guys that are like uh, J.D. Martinez, Josh Donaldson, 
that uh, say, you know, I'm trying to lift the ball. I'm trying to hit the ball in the air um, with authority. And then you see guys where they're only worried about what they call tr- uh, quote unquote true outcomes. They mm-hmm. want a, a walk or a hit. Um, you know, they don't want to move the ball or move the runner over with a ground ball uh, out to second base, you know, um, stuff like that. But launch angle has really, really taken, um, especially with the the increase of the, the information that StatCast is providing, it's really, really taken a lot of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, flack with the, the baseball purists. Um, because when we were growing up, we were taught to hit line drives, hit the ball on the ground, you know, line drives, Mm -hmm. you know, but now you're teaching kids to hit the ball in the air. I, I, I really like what StatCast provides, you know, giving you a launch angle and, and stuff like that. And I know in my realm in predicting fantasy and home runs and stuff like that, we have a, a target launch angle that we want for home runs, doubles, you know, balls that are hit with authority. We also have a, um, a target, you know, basically um, batted ball speed that we want as well. With StatCast, though, is there too much of an emphasis that's being put on launch angle instead of, hey, let's just make the best swing based on the ball like uh, yeah. is this one of the issues with um with the game that you know Manfred's trying to fix but it's being caused by the way that the players are handling it I you know <clears throat> here's here's my kind of take with the launching uh, launch angle deal and this is going to sound really crazy because it's only been in, you know it, it's been the fashion for probably three years now you could already see that some of these new age uh, um, hitting coaches that have been brought in are now more of that the slap and run type. It's more of the back to the line drive type. It's the cut down on the strikeouts. And I think that the Astros had kind of set that in motion. You know, they won it with, yeah, they hit a ton. Of, they hit a ton of home runs and they hit the ball hard, but they did not strike out very often that uh, their World Series team two years ago did not. Um, I think that it's kind of coming around to that. And it's one of those to where, it's that team that's in the out. Uh, it's the team out front that gets a lot of the attention, and that's why I think that the Astros kind of changed that mindset a little bit. Um, it was funny three years ago. Actually, would have been two summers ago. There's a group of us that get invited to uh, to Bush Stadium for a Sunday game. It's called uh, uh, United Cardinals Bloggers. It's there's probably about 25 to 30 people that are in there, and, and Mo will do about a 15 to 20 minute chat session with you. Right. And someone asked him about launch angle and what, and he's, and he didn't, it was, his reaction was, you could tell that this has been something that's been in play inside the clubhouse and inside the lines for years because he, 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 he laughed in a way that it wasn't a looking down type. It was a kind of a, okay, I knew these questions were coming at some point. Mm-hmm. And he made the comment, he was like, hey, you can change your angle all you want. He said, but what actually happens is how hard that ball comes off your bat. Some guys just simply can't do it like others can. And, and then soon after that is when you start seeing the exit velocities pick up, right. you know, one of those to where that kind of became in, in, in fashion again. I think your exit velocities are always going to be there because that's the, that's the, uh, that's the not necessarily outlier. That's the stat that shows how hard balls are being hit. There's high velocity pitchers too, which we know that it works both ways. You know, mm-hmm. it's just going to come off the bat faster. Um, I think that, uh, you're going to hear launch angle enough, but even back in your Wade Boggs days, your George Brett days, and definitely your Tony Gwynn days, when they kind of overran, their launch angles were natural and they were, you know, they were, they hit the ball hard, line drives, and they were gap dudes. Um, I think that we kind of get over, I don't like the idea when you, you you scratch the surface on this. The launch angle fad I, should always be avoided through the high school players, and I even through the college players. The must. I think that that one of those deals should be a tool that's taught to the professional hitter that knows what to do with it. 
Uh, and this is by apply it exactly. exactly, and this is by no means poo pooing it because science shows that it works. Um, so I no, it doesn't bother me that much. I think that we're kind of see a we're kind of seeing it, it kind of revolve back around now to where ball in play is going to be more prevalent than it was the last three years of, hey, big league infielders make these plays. You need to hit it over their head. That's simply, you know, simply the simplest explanation that you're going to hear about the launch angle. It's always going to be around because guys are just playing bigger and stronger than they ever were, and they can hit it out of the ballpark, you know, if you make a mistake. So it's going to stay that way. But I do think it's coming back around to more of the uh, – I think they would like it to be more of the speed game for excitement. I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen, but I do think there's going to be more weight on the guys that strike out less and get more to the doubles type player. Yeah, I I really do agree. Uh, And it kind of leads me into my next point. I think one of the big fads that we're going to see with certain hitters and because of this launch angle slash exit velocity stat cast era is going to be four man outfields. Um, Mm -hmm. we've started to see it a lot more in spring training. Um, and it's, it's basically, I've, I, I can't believe it's taken this long to get to this point. I guess, you know, you have to have enough data to justify it, but I'll take Bryce Harper, for example. Okay. When Bryce Harper hits the ball, being a left-handed hitter, uh, if he hits it in the air, he's going to basically spray it all over the outfield. Okay. Mm-hmm. If he hits it on the ground, uh, let's see here, 34, uh, 65, 65% of the time, it's going to be to the complete right of first, uh, you know, in between first and second base. He only hits the ball 15% of the time on the ground to, or in between second and third, and only 3% of the time to where the third baseman traditionally plays you can go through and you can look at a lot of different hitters like this um and you can see that for some of these guys depending obviously on the pitcher game times or you know game situation stuff like that um you're gonna see see teams put in a four-man outfield um guys like jackie bradley jr uh he only hits the ball to the uh, on the ground to the right side or the left side two percent of the time um you know joey gallo is big like that one of your hometown boys is matt carpenter sure you know 75 percent of the time it's if it's on the ground it's between first and second base um and it's you know people don't like the shifts you know the shift only happens about 17 to 20 percent of the time but you're talking about now, because what's what's the main objective of, of playing defense in baseball? To prevent the other runner f- or the other team from scoring. And so why waste a fielder where you're not going to, where they're not going to hit the ball? A lot of people will say, well, why doesn't Bryce Harper just bunt the ball down the third baseline? Okay, well, the defense wins. The opposing mm-hmm. team wins because now you're taking, you're making the guy change his swing so he can't do damage. Sure. Exactly. And, and it, it, I think this is one of the things that we're going to see a ton of this year. Um, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a, amazing to see the reactions. Sure. And that's, you know, one of the things that, uh, that drives me nuts about, <laughs> about the shift argument is you know it's been around forever. Um, you hit the nail on the head. You have to have data. You have to have data, but you also have to have belief. And I have. A, you are going to know where I'm going with this. Mm-hmm. Matheny did not have belief in it, nope. and he used his starting pitchers as an excuse, saying that they didn't like it. I was, and I thought that that was an excuse to where I, I don't know. It was a head scratcher. You're just like, how do you not like it? You know, you're not. It it it. it I could see on. It, in your past histories of throwing, guys, you feel like you're comfortable where they're supposed to be. But the shift gets out. And it's not like it's a new found deal. You know, it's it's uh, it's obviously polarized right now because people have taken it to the stream, extreme for reasons that you just said. It works. Baseball will adapt. It always does. Hitters will adapt. 
and always I don't, will. It always, they always have. Um, just like we just talked about our last segment. Baseball infielders are good. They take a thousand ground balls, you know, a week. They hardly make mistakes. Um, hit it over their head. Well, you got to learn to hit it where they're where they ain't. You know, the 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 way that that we were all taught to play the game. It they will adapt. It it's I I don't like that it has to be drastic on something that is just because the spotlight's on it now. Right. Being the shifts, it gets out. It works. You're correct. You want Harper. You want Harper Bunny. You know what I mean? You're just like, okay, we prevented you from doing what we think you can do, or well, what we that fear we you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, so yeah, we win. It's that's just how it works. That's you know, the strategy of it, and I, I don't know. I, I think there's a real knee jerk reaction right now to change that, but I think the reaction should be the, uh, you know, change the approach. I and I agree with you. Um, you you've got to find ways to help your ball club as, as much as possible. Um, I found that I was doing some research on this and um, I actually found a article that was talking about this as I was looking through it. And they said they actually have a, a shot from a newspaper clipping. Um, the Reds actually employed a four man outfield against Willie McCovey back in 1969. Mm hmm. So where the shortstop was actually playing in the outfield, I thought I thought it was really cool. So like we said, the shift's been here. It's just now, I, with the media coverage and the and as drastic as we've continued it, you know, it's it's here to stay. It's not going away. And for those people that think like, you know, oh, we should ban the shift and it's going to create more offense. Well, now you're being counterintuitive because or counterproductive with this because if you're wanting to speed up the game. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to create more offense. Yeah, and that's exactly what it's going to do. So, I don't know. It's just it's something that's there. Uh, the other fad that kind of took uh, I don't want to call it a fad because I think it's here to stay, depending on the team um, and the personnel that is within that team, is what the Rays kind of you know yeah. brought to the forefront last year is the opener. Um, I they ended up winning 90 games implying or imploring this this strategy and we saw the Brewers kind of what I thought take it to the ultimate extreme in the playoffs <laughs> um but I think more and more teams are going to start doing this and like I I classify I don't classify the opener as a quote unquote bullpen day you know where you're just you're you guy, your starters are run down, or a guy gets hurt and you can't get a guy up from AAA, or you're in the you know the midst of a you know a doubleheader or something like that. A bullpen day is different. This is a, a an opener that is going to go out there and get you your first three to four outs, and get it to where your starter can get you a full another two times through because the data has shown. Again, this is data and belief and everything like that, that a lot of a lot of pitchers, they get hit harder and it makes perfect sense, you know, playing baseball. They get hot harder the more times they see a batter where I'm a little worried about where this could end up going is with the manipulation of guys coming up and down from the minors and teams, instead of trying to, de to develop starters where you can have a good, say, seven-year career in baseball, they're, I, I don't want them to develop short-term relieving openers because that's what the organizational shift is going to. And now we see a, a quality, the quality of overall pitching end up taking a hit. That's what I'm afraid could it could end up leading to. But from a strategic standpoint, I mean, it works. The Rays shown that they can work. They were competing for a playoff spot. If they weren't in the freaking AL East, mm -hmm. they probably would have made gotten one. So, yeah, no, I agree. And that's that kind of goes back to the money ball issue with me. And, you know, in the early 2000s, so, uh, you know, Bean took, uh, you know, in he, you know, he kind of took the Alderson track and, and kind of ran with it. And that being the, you know, the Bill James beliefs in the, in the war system. 
um, whatever people think about war now. You know, I don't, and like I said, I'm not getting into that. I'm just kind of saying where it, where this started mm-hmm. to where Tampa Bay sees that, hey, on our payroll and our ballpark and our division, we've got to find ways to win. And that's innovation. You know, and that's I, I, I like that. I mean, I was like, you know what? They've got to get people to that ballpark. They've got to be find ways to compete. They've shown that they can develop players, but they can't keep them just for for those that's those same reasons. Um, so the innovation on that I thought was really cool. Um, I thought this is the one where I thought that it, it raised the red flag of when Council did the one hitter against St. Louis in the pennant race. Yeah. Um, and not because he did it; it was because they didn't announce it. They made it sound like they, 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 I think there were some of the unwritten rules that we talk about that were a little taboo about not announcing it. And I think there was a little bit, there were some issues about that. And it's probably stuff that we'll never probably get the, the truth about how significant it was that, uh, what went on behind closed doors, but you know, between baseball and the Brewers at that time, because council did have to come back and, and redact a few things. You could just kind of tell in some of his, his press conferences that, yeah. uh, you know, there were things that he just couldn't approach. Um, that's the thing that I thought re- really brought it to the, the forefront. That, and you're right, the way that he handled it in the playoffs, but they were a game away from the World Series. You know, see, they, they had to be doing something right. Um, and you know what? It, it was funny. They Not necessarily the opener, but how the, the Astros and Hinch ran the bullpen in, uh, you know, the 2017 World Series. It, um, it, there's innovation and it, that's always going to be the per, the people that buck the trend are going to be the are going to be the pariahs in the early going. Um I like the way that you put it though in that I don't want the you know we you and I were raised hey put your horse on the mound and he'll get you seven and we'll figure out how to get the rest. Right. And I like that and I like that form of baseball. And I've even kind of shortened that a little bit. Like go five these these specialized guys that are, are not going to be able to throw five innings because they're pumping at a hundred, you know, that at a, at a rate we've never seen. Let's let that last four innings figure itself out, you know, and I, I could live with that. So there's a part of me that's going to have a hard time letting that go if it actually goes that direction. Um, I, I didn't think it would. I kind of thought it may be a situation to where teams would have to do it like this, where your Oakland's, your Tampa's, you, just to try to find a way to get 27 outs and be creative doing it. I could see it. I could see it sticking around a little bit. Uh, Mo in in uh, in Jupiter had made a comment about it. He was like, "Well, some teams will will are going to explore doing that." I get the feeling that the Cardinals will not be one of those teams. <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I I I just got the feeling that that would be the case. You know, I, it could be a Madden situation. You know, wherever Madden's maybe managing next year, it may be a situation where he would throw in, you know caveats like that so yeah. you're right i think it's, it's going to be around to stay uh i i like your choice of words though of fad because you're right it probably will be implored i don't know if this is one that's ever going to take or is going to be widespread throughout baseball well if you remember correctly i uh, back in i think it was 2011 or 2012 uh dan o'dowd and the rockies tried what they called a piggyback system where they would have four starters, they would go a max of 75 pitches, and then they would have a designated guy that's coming in right behind him to, you know, go another 75 pitches. And the thought was is they were trying to get innovative because obviously pitching in Denver has been so, up until recently, had been such a question mark. They were trying to get these guys to go to be able to pitch more effectively and not have to worry about the wear and tear throughout the course of the season uh, or even the course of the game, considering the fact that, um, you know, it does take a little bit more out of you being an altitude. We all know how that kind of ended up. Um, That was laughed upon. And I think what um, Kevin Cash and the Rays ended up doing was basically taking that idea and saying, okay, well, I don't need my opener to go 75 pitches. But maybe with a traditional starter, I can extend him and have him go the first three or four batters, like we said, and then get my starter into the seventh inning 
to where now I've got my back end guys that I do rely on and trust to get the final, you know, six to eight or six to nine outs. So um, that was that was something like, you know, it, and Billy Bean, even in the money ball era, they were laughed at. You know, so being innovative and being creative mm-hmm. isn't a bad thing. But like you said, there are certain teams that it's that almost kind of have to do it. And then there are certain teams that, you know, they'll do it if the situation presents themselves. And then there are those others that just aren't going to do it. Um, sure, sure. You know, the Cardinals and the Rockies are, are two teams that they've got a nice, good solid five man rotation and then possibly some depth as well. And they're going to do things the traditional way. And they both had success doing it last season. So they're going to continue that. Yeah. It's I, you know, (laughs) your take on that. It was funny. I was thinking this the entire time you're talking about that. I remember that well, because they were implementing that throughout the minor league system. Whenever they were, the Rockies was still affiliated here. Yes. It's also, um, it's, it's funny that, they had so many pitching issues until they bring in a pitching heavy manager and it from the top down. And now look at their rotation. It's yep. solid. And you know, you gotta, you credit blood, bud, bud black for that. You know? So it's uh it, it, yeah, it's definitely crazy how cyclical baseball can be sometimes. Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So we got the hot topics. Um, we could sit there and go on and on and on about stuff like that. Um, we have before. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just so just so everybody knows, we have and we will like, throughout the most of the summer. Um, so let's go through some of these divisional previews here real quick. Um, the AL East. I, I personally think it's a three-man race, three-team mm-hmm. race. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a lot that the Orioles and the Blue Jays are going to be able to say about what's going on up at the top. Um, it's, I think the the Blue Jays are going to be intriguing, and I'll go over uh, exactly why here in just a minute. But when you're looking at um, the Yankees, okay, Obviously, Didi Gregorius is going to be out for a little bit of the year because of Tommy John. Um, they went out and basically they've become the Colorado Rockies of the AL. Uh, they've got Troy Tulowitzki. They've got, you know, DJ LeMayhew, Adam Adevito. They just traded for uh, uh, a guy the other night. Um or they just signed another guy the other night. They've got Adam Adevito in the bullpen. Tommy Canely's in that bullpen. So, um, the way I looked at it is if the, the Yankees have a bunch of Rockies players, right? We obviously have been doing something right, mm-hmm. but you know, they've got, they got one of your former guys, Luke Voigt, who, uh, Aaron Boone has said that both Greg Bird and Luke Voigt are not going to start the season, um, on the, the 25 man. Um, one of them is going down. I tend to think it's Greg Bird cause he still has options left, I believe. But, um, like, you've got your guys that are Aaron Judge, Stanton, Gary Sanchez, obviously. you got uh, Miguel Andahar, who's lacking defensively, but his bat plays. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see them, when we get into, like, mid-August, unless they make a move for that starting rotation... I don't see how they're going to be able to compete with the Red Sox for this division throughout the the length of the entire season. Um, We know that their offense can play. And we know that their bullpen plays. But when you look at their starting rotation, and obviously they don't have Luis uh, Severino yet. He probably won't pitch to the end Mm -hmm. of May. James Paxton is a guy that he can be unhittable at times. Jay Happ is a guy that has pretty decent stuff. I don't know how their stuff is going to play in Yankee Stadium, though. And that's what I'm concerned about. Sure. And yeah, and, and the ballpark factor in that is, is, is massive. You're right. And that, that's the thing. Their, their lineup is, is, is impressive. 
But the rotation just isn't, even with the addition of Paxton. And I've never, you know, Hap has recreated himself in the last three or four years. Um, you know, after his, you know, the first run through Philly and, and all that, he, he had never impressed me. I think they tried to build that Super Bowl pin knowing that the rotation was going to be lacking. And, you know, Severino going out just does not help that. Uh, they do seem like they're missing a piece. You're right. I, going back to the, uh, Bird and uh, Voight situation. The I, as far as on the Goldschmidt front, whenever the Cardinals traded for him, that's I thought either Houston, who has room, or New York would be the one that would be in play for him and possibly overpay for him. Is because they really don't have a solution at first base right now, and you know that's it, it may very well be Andujar. Uh, before it's all said and done, just because of the defensive issues. But, you know, we've seen how that works with Hanley Ramirez. You know, sometimes you just can't put a glove on a guy and it work. Right. Um, yeah, it, it, it's funny. They That division is loaded, and you want to just need your reaction to say the Yankees are going to be pretty good. And I'm sure they're probably going to be a 90-plus win team. But if you look at the 25-man rosters, Boston's significantly better. Right. Uh and it's uh, it's kind of scary to think with the power that they have in the lineup that it's so easy to say that. But uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, you know, Voight was a cold hero in St. Louis just because he was a St. Louis guy and he raked through the through uh, the minor league system. You know, forced his way into the conversation. But he goes to New York, catches a little bit of fire. I just don't know how to how it would sustain. Bird has never helped himself. He was always a player that I always thought could be pretty good. And I and I it was one of those to where. When there was the carousel at first base for the Cardinals, even before the Voight situation, I would have considered Bird, Bird a bigger prospect than Voight in the, in those days, and thought, hey, that'd be a that'd be a good Cardinals get. But uh, but yeah, you're right. I, I just don't know if that's going to work out and how they're how they'll they'll do it. But that's they're also the Yankees and Cashman's, you know, good at you know finding his ways out of the finding his way out of these type of situations. So so I don't know if you were to, if I was to to piggyback the division I would say Boston with a pretty significant lead and then then Tampa and New York a, a heck of a lot closer than than are closer together. I think Tampa Bay's closer to the two of them than people give them credit even after you see the 90 plus wins last year. I think that they they're pretty darn good. And they feel that way too by extending some of their guys on on such easy contracts. Um, you know, when you look at the East and and break that down, you know, we were talking about how, and I know that we'll do we we just kind of scratch the surface on this, and we can go a lot, I, we can go hours and hours and talk about this, and I promise that we won't. But when you look overall at the National League, I mean, you, there's two rebuilding teams right away, and I know that you're going to get into Toronto a little bit in the East. You have Toronto and Baltimore, then you have Kansas City. Chicago and Detroit, and then you have uh, Seattle and Texas. That's a lot of teams right there that are rebuilding, and yeah. that could lead to 90-plus wins where in the National League you could argumentatively say that there's only one team that's admittingly in a rebuild situation. I think San Francisco you could probably put in that, but they're never going to say they're in a rebuild when they have Posey and uh, and Bumgarner. You know, but yep. you know they're probably the they, – I don't know how good they are in that division, so I know that's going on a tangent a little bit. But I think it's significantly easier to win 90 games in the American League this year than it will be in the National League. Yeah, and that's why I don't think, like, you know, a lot of people are going to say they're the best team in baseball. You know, if, you know, the Red Sox come out and win, you know, 110 games, they're the best team in baseball. Well, they're not the best team in baseball, I don't think, because their record shows it. Like, I think you have to classify it as, you know, who has the best record in baseball and who's the best team in baseball. Because, like we've we've mentioned it a couple times, the National League is going to be a dogfight, and we're just going to, especially in some of the in a couple of these divisions, they're just going to beat each other up. Um, and I, I firmly believe that you know having the best record does not make you the best team, um, because you can have you can have holes and not be not. I mean, it, I'll take the Indians for example. They could legitimately win 90 games. Yeah. And I don't think that they make the playoffs if they're not in the AL Central. Uh, yeah. Well, and you know what? And you, that's I was going to talk about that here in a second. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Think about how bad that division is when you lose arguably the best shortstop in baseball and pretty much one of the most underrated third basemen in the last three or four years. He's a 40 doubles machine. Gets hurt last week. And no one's wavering about them winning that division. Right. No one. I mean, I think Minnesota may be sneaky good, 
But you're right. They may win 90 plus games, beat up on that division and not be a very good team. You know, so I, I, I think it speaks more to the weaknesses than it does their strength. I mean, that's exactly. I think that says a lot. I mean, there's no question at all that they're the best team in the division. They may be without, you know, t- two fourths of their infield, you know, for, you know, uh, several weeks of the open uh, to open the season. Yeah, I mean, OK, so let's talk about the Blue Jays here real quick. And I just to give you an example, I mean, this is so the Orioles are just a complete mess. Um you know, this is your starting rotation for for the Baltimore Orioles. Is Dylan Bundy, Andrew Kashner, Alex Cobb, David Hess, and Jeffrey Ramirez. I mean, we know Bundy because he's a local guy. Um, and we've watched him kind of grow up through high school. But outside of him, you know, Kashner maybe give you a couple good games. Um, I don't... There, I don't see anybody that's got the ability to go out and say, okay, here's your stopper every five days. Um, as much as I love, you know, the local kid in Bundy, like with, and you put out the offense that they have, like there's a lot to be desired on the Orioles and I, they could end up losing a hundred games again this year. Oh yeah, I I I think that's probably a given. I mean, that's one of those to where their lineup is unrecognizable, you know, to anybody that doesn't dig dig deep mm-hmm. into lineups. And it's 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 going to be a, it's a weird situation. But I think that uh, you know Hyde was brought on to I, they they needed a new regime so bad. And they they honestly I hate it's tough to say this with a team with this kind of history. They they need a facelift from the top down and i mean from the top top down you know it, it it's it's one of those angelos i know the the sons are trying to change perception and they're trying to create an organizational facelift but this could be a long road for them i would even consider it you know necessarily a re i don't think they've reached rebuild state yet i think this is still complete tear down and hopefully to get what you can at the deadline for whatever players you're you're hoping a VR has a huge first half. You're hoping you know, any so you of could these guys them. have a huge yeah. Half so I mean, you it, can get it's, some more assets back. It's yeah. It's that's it's scary what could happen to them in that division. I agree with you. And triple digit losses, I think, may be one of those. Uh, uh, maybe the easiest <laughs> easiest prop that you can make. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's talk about the Blue Jays here real quick, then we'll move on. Um, I'm excited about the Blue Jays come. You know, April, May, mm-hmm. uh, maybe even the end of May, early part of June, because uh, I just want to see these young kids come up and start smashing the ball. Uh, you've got Guerrero Jr., you've got Bo Bichette, you've got Biggio. They're all knocking on the door of the Blue Jays, and they are all very, very, very good uh, hitters and have absolutely just smashed through the minor league system. Um, obviously, I'm not going to get into the service time issues because we those have been well addressed. But like you're gonna you're gonna see these guys at some point this season. Like there's already trade rumors for Kevin Pillar. Um, you know you've got you know Freddie Galvis that signed a one year deal that could end up if he performs being on a contender uh, after the All Star break. You've got Justin Smoke and Brandon Jury. Um, you know, that could Kendris Morales could help somebody out. So, and that's not even to go over their pitching staff. Um, I do think that obviously the Blue Jays are better than the Orioles and they're going to win some ball games, but they're not going to, it's, they're not going to compete. Um, as far as an overall concept or an overall, uh, in the division, they're not going to compete. Um, they're trying to get guys right now having good first halves to where they can garner trade interest for any of these guys, whether that be in the lineup or a Marcus Stroman or Andrew Shoemaker or sorry, not Andrew Shoemaker, Aaron Sanchez. Like those are the guys that they want to get. They they've got to get these guys out so they can keep developing and moving forward. And um, I'm excited to see these young bucks come up and hit. Sure, and and they they kind of drafted to that ballpark as well, you know. And and I know it's easy to say that because Baltimore could have done the same thing, 
you know, with the ball, the way the ball flies out of there. But, but yeah, they, it's, they're going to be exciting. That's the one thing that gets overlooked quite a bit is Shapiro knows how to make ball clubs. Yes. And he'll turn them around quickly. You know, yeah, if you remember when we were growing up, Cleveland, awful. Yep. Till the nineties. And then all of a sudden things start changing and they, they've been, you know, on that path now for 20 plus years, you know, and that was, that was a Shapiro gig. He'll do the same thing here. They'll be really good. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll compete. Even in a tough division, they'll compete. And, uh, yeah, it's exciting. It, it's funny that they can completely rebuild their infield by the middle of May and in, in June. And yeah. it may be one of those situations if you don't, if, you, if none of the guys are starstruck, you may improve yourself by bringing those guys up. Yeah, exactly. I, I think they are. Um, you know, and it's, you know, draft picks are important in MLB, but they're not vitally as important as you see, like in, you know, the NFL um, or NBA, where, you know, it's not a guarantee that a number one overall pick is going to be in, you know, the major leagues, let alone in the major leagues to be impacting anybody that's on your current roster. Um, very, very rarely does that happen. So let's move on to the AL Central here. Uh, we touched a, a lot on or a little bit on the, the Indians. Um, there was word that came out that Jose Ramirez could be ready by opening day. Uh, I, I don't know how you get carted off the field after fouling a foul ball off the <laughs> foot, which we yeah. both know hurts, um, and be ready by opening day. But, like... I mean, they signed Cargo, they signed Hanley Ramirez, who's both of them. Uh, well, Cargo's got an April 20th opt out, but it uh, looks like Hanley's going to break camp with uh, with the big club. Um, you've got Jason Kipnis that's down. Lindor's down until, what, mid-May, end of May, I think, is the target date. Uh, like, is it is it out of the realm of possibilities that we could see – the Indians being a third place club um, going into July and not like completely draw. No, 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 no. I get you. I get it, you. But like, like the, the twin, I feel like the twins and the white Sox are good enough to maybe compete. And I don't think like this could be a division where all of the teams are, are within two games of 500 or below um, by the beginning of July. Like, this is not a sexy division at all. No, 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 no. And that's and then you know two teams, two teams are definitely mailing it in, and it may be two and a half because I'm not certain what the White Sox are doing right now. You know, I think that I think they wanted to speed the process up, of, uh, speed the rebuild process up by bringing Machado in. Um, well, that goes without saying. They definitely wanted to do that, and I think that that probably puts them a little ahead of schedule, but after kind of sitting back on that and not doing anything else, I think they may be willing to take their lumps one more year or to see how close they can get to that second wild card. They can be Minnesota is the one that could be sneaky. Good. Um, and that's that, that'll be, that will be the interesting one to watch. I just can't imagine the only thing that I think hurts Cleveland and not necessarily in Lindor, not necessarily Kipnis or Ramirez is if the pitches really start taking a toll on on Kluber's arm. Uh, I think that's why the interest in him wasn't it, – it, it may have been wide interest that we didn't know, but the, the price tag may have been high in any trade of, of a starter. Kluber's a stud. Don't get me wrong, but, boy, he throws a lot of pitches, and he yeah. has over the last two or three years. I think if they're pitching falters, they could be in trouble, especially in the early going when they don't have a Lindor to count on. Uh, their outfield still kind of – still, you know, is, is still sketchy. I mean, you saw how late they signed Cargo. You know, that's one of those to where I know, you know, several friends of mine who are big Indians fans are just like, why aren't they making a move in the outfield now? Why do you wait till the end of spring training to do so? So, right. so I don't know. I don't, it, it's funny. If there's a team that I think could catch them quickly, it would probably be Minnesota. The White Sox are that team that I still just can't figure out. Loaded with talent. You know, Jimenez will be up all year. You wonder when Luis Robert will be here. Um, they, they didn't necessarily. Straighten up the shortstop issue. That will be something to watch. But I think they may be close, but at close still to me, may be another year. And I think that the Indians, unless they fall apart, could, could be a situation like that to where it could just be a flat, ugly division. And they win it by attrition, you know, because one of your better players, you know, yeah, doesn't I, play June. 
Exactly. And I think with Robert, I think it depends on how things go with the first half. Yeah. Um, I think if they're in contention for the division, you know, come the all-star break, I think you could end up seeing him mid July. Um, as long as he's healthy, because he's going to come up and he's going to be one of those guys that he's, he's a type of talent that could be an immediate impact. Um, they're pitching their bullpen worries me, you know, past, <laughs> past Carlos Rodon, you don't have a lot of, uh, I mean, you've got an, a Von Nova, but you don't have a lot of bullet tested arms there. I mean, Giolito used to be a high, high, uh, prospect for the nationals, but it, it really, really, really does worry me as far as the White Sox. And like, you're right. I actually really, if I think the wild card for the twins is how does Michael Pineda perform? Yeah. I think if he's anything like we know he can be, I think this is the Twins division. I think they end up overtaking the Indians, especially if, um, you know, something like you said does happen with the uh, with the arms that the Indians are rolling out in their rotation. Yeah, I mean, it, I, it could be very easy to see them taking a step back pitching wise for for that reason. Just, you know, Bauer's Bauer. You know, Kluber's the one that that that's concerning, uh, and the fact that there's a lot of mileage on his arm right now. Yep. All right, let's move on to the American League West here. Um, I think it's safe to say that it's the Astros division and everybody's kind of else just in a different realm. Um, It would take something major for me to not pick the Astros, but I do think that the A's are going to compete for a wild card spot. Sure. Um, The... The injury to uh, Matt Olson hurts. <laughs> uh, That's the concern. Yeah. No. Uh, how's he going to be after that um, that hamate bone it, uh, surgery? You, you never. Nope. That's a, you never regain strength. It's about a year for you to uh, regain strength, especially as a hitter. It's well, scary. That's that, that kind of the thing. what de- derailed Pablo's uh, Pablo Sandoval. Oh sure. Um, yeah. You know he did just. Yeah, that's that's never an injury that you want to hear as a hitter. No, 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 no. Yeah, hand and wrist are the things that yeah they heal fairly quickly, but you don't regain strength. Um, so it's it yeah, that's a little worrisome when I saw that too. But yeah, I like their lineup though, you know. And that's it's funny being out west, you, you get buried and you forget how good some of those teams are. You know, Chapman's one of those that's a stud. He's right up there with Arenado, yeah. but you don't hear that much about him. You know, it's 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 crazy how just being out there on the on the Lake Coast makes such a difference. And, you know, here's my question to you though. I know that we've said this forever, and I know that they've aged a little bit. Could you see the Angels being a lot better than you think? Yes, and that's exactly see, that's... where I was about to go. Um, you know, the the all, the question mark with the Angels is always going to be their rotation. Um, you know, they don't have a guy that what I would consider being a one or a two on most of the, most of the teams in baseball. Uh, Matt Harvey obviously has that capability if he's right. Um, And he's looked really good this spring so far. I think Harvey could end up being their ace by the time all is said and done. And we get into, you know, June, July, but that offense, man, that's I think that's a very, very, very underrated offense that not a lot of people are going to be looking at as one of those that, you know, can go out and compete against some of the top line arms, not only in that division, but in uh, the American League night in and night out. Yeah, that's and it, it will be the rotation that sets the that, that sets the tone there. I mean, I have a there's something that tells me that Trout's going to have even a, a, a bigger year than normal. And I think that may be the cost certainty on that now. Um, so that I think their lineup could be pretty good. Um, Zach Cozart uh, has to get back to what he was uh, the end part of St. L- or Cincinnati, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, um, I, I don't, the Cozart deal is weird. You know, for the for years he couldn't hit. <laughs> 
you know, the Cincinnati knock, and then he just kind of took off in Cincinnati. So the injury kind of derailed him a little bit last year. Yeah. So I wonder how much that would be a factor as well. Um, their infield it could be a lot better. I was kind of always a Cozart guy, but you know, he's even in the, you know, 32, 33 season at this point. But I do think they're going to be a lot better. You know, last year they had, you know, some atrocious, atrocious performances by some of their outfielders, not named, um, not named, um, uh, yeah, well, I cannot Trout. believe it. I'm like Trout. You know what I mean? They were they were really bad. My phone's going off. I'm sorry. The, uh, um, so yeah, it's it's one of those to where they could be they could be in the mix for a little while. I think, and I I, I just wonder if Moreno is if it's gotten to that point. I know he he just spends stupid money sometimes. That if they're going to wheel and deal a little bit to kind of to kind of make some things happen while they have Trout there. And, that you know, they had the, the dwindling pool host contract that's going to be – it's going to submarine them before too long. They've got to win, and they may be in a more win-now mode than, than we realize. Yeah, uh, it's – it's. I, I – like, I could see this offense being really, really good. Like you said, they got Justin Upton. They've got Justin Bohr. Uh, you know, Albert Pujols is there. He's going to probably hit five, six again this year for most of the year. Uh, Andrew and Simmons had the best offensive career he's ever had, uh, last season. Um, Cole Calhoun has to bounce back. Um, but like you said, when guys like Eric Young Jr. are taking a lot of your reps in the outfield, you need a little bit of help there. So yeah. that's the big thing. Um, yeah. Simmons is another player that just gets buried. You know how highly I think of him. Yeah. And he just gets buried out there. Yep. Um, all right. Rangers, they're going to put up some runs. Um, they're going to strike out a lot. And their pitchers are, I hate the, this word that I'm about to use, they're a bunch of retreads. Their, their starting rotation right now is looking like Mike Miner, Lance Lynn, Edison Volquez, Drew Smiley, and Shelby Miller. Like, and you put them coming to July and August in that ballpark and <laughs> that heat. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, now they're going to score a lot of runs. You know, that's a, that's an offense that can put some crooked numbers on the board, but between them, like, I, the Mariners at least have some direction, I feel. Sure. And some intrigue. Um, you know, they, they made the deal for Edwin this this last offseason. They've still got D. Gordon up there. At the, Mitch Hanniger's come into his own. And oh, he's, yeah. He's yeah. one of the best, you know. Another another West Coast guy that gets forgotten. Yeah. You know, that's – you're. I agree with that. And yeah, in direction is well put. That's where – I mean, you could, you could probably throw them – it would be easy to throw them in that rebuild category, but I do think uh, I do think Trader Jerry did did them right by unloading some contracts and and they, they, they're going to be they are not as for somebody that lost the amount of talent that they lost um, they're going to be a lot better than than they let on. Yeah, I, I think they will too. The guy I'm the guy I'm really really excited to keep watching and see how he develops coming over from Japan is uh you see kikuchi um it, he's he's got that intrigue he's just got that aura about him uh coming over from the east that i want to see how he adapts to uh big league hitting um you know i i think he's going to be really really good the first time kind of through the league until that book gets written and then i think it's going to go from there so I want, I'm really kind of excited to, to see him. Um, all right, before we get into the big two divisions, I want to touch on the NL East just here real quick. Uh, this is going to be – okay, so let's talk about the Marlins real quick. Um, okay, so let's talk about <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. Uh, no, okay, so the Marlins really – they don't have a lot um, going for them. Uh, they unloaded the rest of their roster. And now it's just trying to play the prospect game with them. 
and they have said that, you know, we want to make coming out to the ballpark an experience. Well, in order for that to be good for your fans, you have to win. And you're not putting a product – you're putting a product out there that's going to compete and play hard, but they're not very good to win a lot of ball games right now. And in this division, you're going to lose a lot. Sure. So uh, that's about all the breath that I'm going to waste on the Mariners or the Marlins. No. I, and that was that was well summed up. I mean, that was one of those to where, you know, arguably that would be the one team that you would consider in a rebuild mode, you know, that's uh, that I would think in the, in the National League. I know Arizona, you could probably argue, too, and San Francisco. You know, we hit, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But, yeah, you're going to lose playing 19 games against the other four teams in the National League East. You're going to lose a lot of games because yep. the pitching's loaded in that division. Yep. All right. Let's talk about the Mets. Talk about pitching. You've got uh DeGrom, Syndergaard, Wheeler, Mats, Vargas. Uh, the only one that I have a question about is Vargas. Um, <laughs> otherwise, that's a – like, this this division is is loaded when it comes to quality starters on the actual um, rosters. Like, the question with the, the Mets has always been the last couple of years, can they stay healthy, one, mm-hmm. and can they hit, two? Well, you go out and you add a Robinson Cano. You go out, you sign a Wilson Ramos. Um, you're still waiting on uh, Cespedes to come back. You're, you've got Michael Conforto. Is he going to make yeah turn that corner again? Exactly. Um, you know, you still don't have an answer at first base. You you don't have an answer at third base. Like it's there are major holes in this lineup. And they're going to a lot of the games that they win are going to be on the back end of those arms, not only in the bullpen, but in the starting rotation as well. Yeah, that's it. They're going to have to ride the pitching out. I mean, it's it's one of those to where let me just throw, let me throw a question to you. How how prevalent is Cano looked at as, as a DFS type selection? Um. Not a lot, okay. Especially if he's going to end up being at first base. Yeah. Um, now, last year he was buried out there in uh, Safeco or what used to be Safeco, so like it, it took a lot to kind of play those guys, anyways. Um, one because they're on the West Coast, and so yeah. you usually had other targets that you wanted to do, but you know if Cano is um, you know, around that mid mid price range, like if the price is right and the matchups right, then yeah, you could probably go there. Um, especially in the NL East with some of these ballparks, but like being in city and if he's listed at a, as first, first base with a power position, probably not a lot. No. Well, and I, I wondered about that. I mean, just because I've always, I've never been a big Cano fan, but I've always thought, boy, that he, boy, he can hit. You know, his numbers were good. Conforto is the one that I think could be a stud. He was one where, where they kind of weren't certain what direction they were going to. That's where I was hoping that he would be available at some point, because I, I think that he's going to be the real deal. Um, the injury last year probably set him back a little bit. I'm not sure, but him playing a quarter every day this year will probably help. You know, I think that their roster was just kind of ugly last year with Bruce and all the guys to where just the, the pieces just didn't fit. Um, yeah, but you, I mean, you've got to ride out the rotation though. I mean, you, you've this, it's just too good and you only have it for a limited amount of time unless you can start signing these guys, which a New York team can do, but I just don't see it. There seems, there's always some, there's always a disgruntled Met. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's always, there's just, there's just always situation with them. I like the way, not, not to keep kind of bouncing around here. I like the fact that they kept Alonzo, that he hit his way onto the team. Yes. But, you know, that also puts Cano at second if they're going to do that. Or, you know, are, are you going to split time? I, I don't think you can do that. If you have him on the club, I think he's got to play every day. So so it's still my, my point being, and it's kind of a long way around it, it does kind of seem like misfit toys, you know, this roster does as of right now to me. Yeah, and I, I honestly really don't think that they have a direction. They're trying to win, but they don't have a – they don't have anybody that you can really count on – 
day in and day out, they're going to have to manufacture and, and rely on the pitching, like you said. So, sure. Uh, let's talk about the Braves. Um, man, they've got some excitement. They Boy. got a lot of excitement. Yeah. Um, they went out and they signed Josh Donaldson. He's going to bat second and play third for him. Uh, they've, they've got, I mean, they've got to be one of the most exciting teams. They, they're definitely the most exciting team in this division, in my opinion, when it comes to youth. But oh yeah, maybe even the the whole National League. Um, as far as when you you're talking about you know Acuna, mm. you're talking about Swanson, Ozzy Albies, Enciarte. Uh, then you throw in the veterans like Donaldson, Freeman, and Marcakis, and Flowers in there. Man, I don't even think Marcakis has to do what he did last year for these guys to be competing at the top of the division. Yeah, I completely agree. That's, uh, I think that they're, I, me personally, I was surprised. I know they have a lot of arms and I know they have a lot coming. I was surprised they didn't dip their toe into the Keiko market a little bit more. I'm just for a little bit of stability because I think their lineup is loaded. I think Acuna, Acuna is a stud. You know, I was like, this is, I would take Acuna over Soto pretty, pretty easily, to be honest with you. You know, and it's, uh, um, yeah, I think he's just that. Their, their, their day in, day out lineup is, you talk about a rebuild that's, that's worked. I mean, you know, Freeman stayed through the whole thing and this accelerated. You remember they were like, I can't believe you're taking that ball club into the, into the new ballpark. Well, they made the playoffs last year. You yeah. know what I'm saying? They're, uh, they're, they're pretty dang good. I, I think this is one of those to where I think they, they're going to be right in the mix. I think it's probably going to be a three-headed monster when it's all said and done at the top. And uh, I think they're as good as any team in the East, if not the National League. Yep. The one thing I am worried about is them moving Acuna to the four hole. Yeah. Um, maybe trying to do too much. For me, I don't like messing with young players. And, and once they get comfortable and show that they're able to be productive, um, for me, I would have left him in that one hole and Ciarte in that two hole. And then backed up Freeman with Acuna, uh, um, or backed up Freeman with uh, Donaldson. Yeah. So that's the way I would have done it. And we could see it. You know, if Acuna comes out the gate struggling and, you know, he's won for his first 18 with seven strikeouts, you know, we could see that flip. So uh, that's the one good thing is nothing's kind of set in stone here. Um, and then the Nationals. You got probably the <laughs> weirdest constructed lineup that I've ever seen when it comes to a combination of guys that are homegrown, young guys that are homegrown, um, guys that have been there the whole career, and then kind of guys that they've thrown in and signed off the street. Yeah. Uh, big addition is Brian Dozier. Um, that's not the really a big addition, but that's their biggest addition in the everyday lineup as far as signing outside the organization. Yeah. Um, and Jan and it, Gomes. Well, and it would have been a huge addition if he didn't have last year. Yeah. You know, Dozier. And it's uh, so you do, you kind of wonder what he has, what he has left. This is one of those teams, though, to me that I hope this makes sense. That losing Harper may be releasing the pressure valve and we may see how good they really are addition by subtraction yeah yeah and it's one of those because i think rendon's a stud and i think that he's been overshadowed by harper a lot and i think he's going to be the next guy that, that commands a lot of money um and you know and see here's here's the thing with that is there's i know you know this but there's a lot of bickering going back who's better rendon or or, or nolan and you know back and forth i, I might be bias i don't think like there it's even a question sure like i think rendon is a very 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 good maybe even a great yeah but you're talking about nolan being when there's all said and done i think he could be the best of all time at third base sure but you know that he's going to command nolan arenado type money hey, well yeah exactly i and i agree wholeheartedly with you on that i uh and i think even in the mountain time that Arenado gets gets overlooked a lot. I mean, I would take Arenado over Machado all day, every day. You know, it's you know, it's one of those to where I've I've always said that. 
And it's so it, that's it. He's on a different planet to me. I think Rendon is a stud. I think he's that next tier type guy. And I think that, you know, his, it's amazing to me when you look at his numbers that he doesn't get more hub of over those years. I mean, yeah. cause he's a devil's machine in that ballpark. Oh yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's, he could, he could be a pay. Eaton doesn't get out. Turner is crazy athletic. And then you have the, you know, you know, have, you have Soto. You not have not a even their most quote unquote prized rookie. No. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the, here's what's so funny about that. I remember last off season having the conversation of is Robles and Okuna who, Okuna who's the better player. Right. Well, you know, then Soto comes out of nowhere, really. And the you only know, reason was, he it, came he came up, if you remember correctly, is because Robles got hurt. Yeah, yeah, and that's <laughs> uh, so that it opens up that spot. You know that so their outfield could be exciting, and and you may have to expect a sophomore slump. But you know Robles didn't get did see much time last year, so you may not have today. To. Yeah, so, so yeah, I think that this is one of those teams that that may be better by losing the player that they had, I, and that's nothing against Harper. It's just that it's one of those that it. I, I just feel like they may be better off today than they were, and I think that Rizzo may have known that. Yeah. And that, like I said, it's nothing against him because I honestly thought that, you know, I've all, I've always thought that Boris worked for the learners because every con, every or vice versa, because every free agent that Boris ever had high dollar guy always seemed to make his way back to Washington. And I thought the longer that it went on, I could see him going back to Washington at this point. And I just wonder how much of that, uh, how much of the talk of this is what we're going to be able to offer you right at the end of the season. I bet that stuck. I bet it stuck more than, than I would have, I would, if I would, I wouldn't have said that in February, I would have said, I bet they came off that and worked it. But I, I seem to think that that was the offer that they threw at him and, and stayed there. Yeah. I, I agree with you a hundred percent. You know, it's, it's always going to be a big thing. You know, what does this, what does this pitching staff give you? You know, you add Patrick Corbin. You still got, you know, you add Anibal Sanchez. You still got Jeremy Hellickson. Um, or no, not still. He comes over from Philly, actually. Uh, but you still got Max and Strasburg up there at the top. Who I think's uh, the best. I mean, it's. I mean, this this pitching staff is as long as they stay healthy, they're. I'd say top three in the na- in the National League, maybe all of baseball. Oh yeah, yeah. With that, with, I think so. I think so. And you you they, you could probably be in that argument with Scherzer and Strasburg alone. Alone. Then you bring in Corbin, who uh, you know he was the prize of the market, and of, oh, of yeah. course you see that now because he signed the quickest. Um, their bullpen is going to be really good too, you know, because that was always an issue. I really wanted the Cardinals to give to take a flyer on Rosenthal because I think he's going to be back to his pre injury pre uh pre Tommy John uh dominance. I think their bullpen's going to be really good. I, I think they put together a really good team. Yeah, I I do too. I really really do. All right, let's go to your home neck of the woods, NL Central. Uh Brewers ended up um getting worse. <laughs> I think um I- if you hear if you hear anybody in the uh, Milwaukee media talk, you hear that a lot. I, I don't think you hear it as much at the National League. They think their pitching is going to be better than it looks on paper. Um, I have a I don't I know. I hope he, it's better than. It looks well, on paper. and here's the way that I look at that. I think he's going to have a hard time going to that well again. You know, yeah, because there's no way he can ride that bullpen like he did. Yeah, last year. and they and they have some outcasts. You know, they they had some guys that had a hard time keeping anywhere else. I mean, Chassin, who you know well, is their opening day guy. Yeah. You know, and it's one of those to where, you know, I'm playing Mike Liss all day in, the, in that opener. And I, I mean, I may very well be wrong. I mean, they're coming off, a, off of, uh, you know, basically, you know, one win shy of the National League Championship last year. So their, their lineup is going to be very, very good. I mean, they're, they're, you're looking at a lineup to where you may go Grandall and Mustakis like six and seven. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be pretty good. Um, it's still, it's still their, their lineup looks a little convoluted when you're looking at Mustakas at second. 
Um, I really like Travis Shaw, though. I think that he gets overlooked a lot, and I thought he got overlooked in Boston. I thought they just gave up on him a little too quick because I think he can rake. Their lineup's going to be really good, but I'm still not convinced their pitching's that that much better. Um, and then if you're going to – their bullpen, their two biggest bullpen arms not named Hader aren't going to be on the opening day roster, yeah. you know, in Jeffries and um, and Knable. So I just wonder that's going to be a, that's going to be a problem. Whenever I heard the Kimbrel talk, I was like, well, even at this point, he's not going to be ready to go until the it's end okay. of April. Yeah, exactly. That's the card. That's what the Cardinals did last year when they they cut the low hanging fruit in Holland, and he talked his way into coming into camp a little bit sooner than expected, and he never never got his legs underneath him. You know, he struggled all year, and I have a feeling that's probably what Kimbrel is going to go through. I I will say I do think that the Braves are the are lying in wait on the Kimbrel, Kimbrel market. That's the one thing I can see happening is uh, Kimbrel going back home because that's what you can see one of those make good deals there. Yeah. Um, I think the Brewers are going to be good. I think it's going to be – I think the division is going to be really good. Oh, yeah. I uh, think this is one of the best uh, – outside of the NL East, I think this is the deepest division in baseball. I, I can see that. I can see that honestly because you know because Pittsburgh's going to be Pittsburgh's going to have some arms. They're going to be pretty good. Cincinnati's done the right thing. I'm not so certain that Puig and uh, Kemp are going to have the impact that a lot of people do. I thought their I thought their outfield was really good last year. Yeah. To uh, to go ahead and change that. I, I they may rake early in the season and Puig may have a huge year. I I, I could see that happening. Kemp in the Cincinnati Heat in that ballpark, I think his body's given up on him in the last three second halves. Uh, I think he may have some trouble there. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you about that. One. And I'm still, I think Sonny Gray will be really good getting back, uh, reuniting with Derek Johnson, who on the flip side, I think is going to cost the Brewers a little bit losing him. I think that he is, he's worth his weight in gold as a pitching coach. I, I think that that's going to hurt them. Uh, I think it's going to benefit Cincinnati. But I still think they're a couple of arms short. Um, the Cubs, their lineup's just so good. Um, unless, you know, they won, you know, 90 plus games last year on a team that they would say was a disappointment. Um, my, the thing with the Cubs, and I'm honestly not saying this as a Cardinals fan, is the Cubs are in trouble because there's chinks in the armor and the Bills about to come due. You know, yes. it just feels like things are caving in. And it's starting so, with their manager. Yeah, exactly. You go from Russell. You go from the emails of the owner. You go from Madden. It just seems like things could be cratering there. And it could be a situation to where what we saw Theo do in Boston. You sell your soul to the devil to win that championship and – you could you, it things could be falling apart. Uh, yep. Bryant doesn't seem to be willing to give them a discount. No, He's especially after market. seeing what Nolan just got. Exactly, exactly. You send down Hap, who I think is a really good player, and it, you know he, that you send down a guy that's that is very helpful. That's not that's you know it, there's always going to be disgruntled guys that get sent down. Yeah. Um, the Russell deal is ugly. Very. Uh, uh, yeah, you know. It's 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 going to be a situation. Um, the they Darvish could, deal looks like crap yeah, right now. Well, and Morrow. I mean, you know, they yeah. they those guys. And then uh, who was the Rocky they signed that couldn't throw strikes? Um, what's hey. his name? I'm drawing a complete blank. I'm sorry. We've gone through so much. Um, can't think of his name. You know, he was their big free agent. Oh, Tyler Chatwood. Yes, exactly. To where uh, you know he 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 struggled and. I, I like Lester. Lester's going to hit a wall at some point, but he knows how to get people out. Uh, I just don't think they're going to be as good, and that makes me wonder why those Dakota projections were as bad as they were. I couldn't figure out why. I mean, they projected them to be the last place team in the division, and I was surprised. But I don't think they're that incredibly far off. I do think they're going to be one of the top three teams in the division, but they may not be as good as we think they are. Yep, I uh, agree with you. I do say this, and I'm going to fanboy out. I think the Cardinals have done the right thing. You know, for the last two years, they you've wanted that bat. Um, it's so funny being a Cardinal fan right now, though, because people don't appreciate what Goldschmidt is. They don't appreciate. I don't it. think they know what Goldschmidt. Well, is. Well, and you're right. And I think another factor in that is the fact that. Harper and Machado were still out there when they got him because all I heard all year, all from December on until he signed was 
we've got Goldschmidt now what else? And you're just like, hey, all the Cardinals, all that we've wanted, all uh, all that the organization has wanted was that bat, was that game-changing bat. They thought it was going to be Ozuna, and it wasn't. To be honest with you, o- Ozuna 17 may be the outlier. We may get Ozuna what he was last year. You know, he was hurt. You could tell. But that's that's maybe the player that he is. Goldschmidt's one of those, you know, uh, he is going to be he's, – he's not the billboard-type guy, but he's got the billboard-type numbers. And I don't think people fully appreciate that. Um I'm just happy to see him out of the NL West. Exactly. I think you're going to hear that a lot. Um, Cardinals pitching's loaded. They're going to be really good. Uh, they're going to be really deep. Um, I think they're going to win the division. I think you're looking at probably a 92-93 win team. A player that I will say that on a fantasy level I would probably make a play on and I would definitely keep tabs on him day to day, I think D. Young has a big, big year. I think he does too. I think that that's going to be one of the guys that you look at. I think you're going to get Carpenter, probably not the power of Carpenter last year, but I think you're probably going to approach the 40 doubles, probably the 25, 30 homers, you know, a healthy Carpenter. I think you're going to get that uh, top of the lineup. I think you're going to get a bounce back of Dex. I really do. Bader, there's going to be questions about Bader hitting right-handed pitching that may always exist, but the thing is I think this lineup may allow a guy like Bader and Wong to do what they do best, and that's probably defend. But, you know, you know, you swing into one a little bit, have some occasional pop. I think you're going to see quite a few stolen bases out of those guys, too. I think the shield factor is going to make a big difference in in St. Louis. Uh, I think think that, uh, you know, it was funny. We had Jeff Jones, one of the media guys on, and he was really good. And I I asked him, I said, was the pressure valve released? He said it was within days. He said you could feel it that night. He goes, they say they didn't know they fired him. He goes, but you could tell in that clubhouse that night. So I think that the Schilt uh, camp is going to make a big difference. I think that there was a lot of uh, – if you hear any of the guys like um, Andrew Miller was bragging about it, you know, Drew Robinson, who's going to be – he's going to be a role player, you know, may not even spend the whole se- whole season in St. Louis, may have to ride that shuttle to Memphis quite a bit. And, right. But he's been in several camps, and, and uh, he was talking about just how how well camp went. How how organized it was and stuff, which told me that the two newcomers were saying that. I think there was a, a Colt Wong article that came out in the Athletic about three or four days ago that you got the feeling real quick that he did not like the old regime, you know. And it's and I just wonder how much of a factor that's going to be. Molina's going to be Molina, you know. He's going to hit a wall someday. I don't expect it to be this soon. I just think they're going to be really good. Um, the division's going to be really tough. Uh, you can't have any slip ups, but I, I think that they'll probably end up being the best team in the division. Yeah, I'm I'm really really excited to see what uh, these young arms and Flaherty and Dakota Hudson actually That's, can provide. Well, and that was me. I uh, I wanted, er, I had an educated lead. I'll say that Keuchel was in was a factor, and there was some mutual conversations going on. It wouldn't shock me. Yeah, and that was kind of on the fact that you didn't know what you were going to get out of Wainwright. But Wainwright's looked good, and hes I think they had a lot of faith in what he was going to do. And I think that there i think there was more question marks with Carlos Martinez than they wanted to admit. I know that at the All-Star break last year that the organization was really, really frustrated with Carlos Martinez and Ozuna, and you know, work and showing up on time were issues. Uh, and it was – it was it was pretty ugly, I think, and I don't know how that was right around the time of the change in in management. Then when they bring Martinez back as a bullpen piece, then there's a lot of talk of hey, is he better out there because he can he can stay focused day to day instead of showing up late for his starts and having poor first innings and not showing you know he's one of the best arms in the game and it just hadn't shown yet. Um, I think that that was a lot of the Keiko talk to see what went on, but it's a lot another long way around for me to say this. Dakota Hudson was the pitcher, you know, was the, uh, you know, the most valuable pitcher, however you want to word it, in double A and triple A in the last two years. Mm-hmm. You had him in the bullpen, in a bullpen that didn't strike too many guys out. He's got a power sinker where people just can't elevate it, which is how Keiko has made his money. I like the fact that they're just like, hey, 
let's go with Hudson on this. I like him more as a as a starting rotation piece than I did in the bullpen. I'm a big strikeout guy in the bullpen. Um, I really like what John Gant brought him last year, but he's he doesn't have an option. If he had an option, he would be their sixth starter in Memphis right now. I think that's going to probably go to Gomber and Ponce de Leon, and they're going to that they'll be the next two guys up. Gant will stay in the bullpen for the most part for now. I like how they're breaking camp. I really do. Um, you know, the Jerko injury means that you're going to get Munoz, who I think belongs, and a Drew Robinson who has flexibility up in the uh, in the early going. But I think they've put together a really good team, and I think that. Uh, the, the new coaching staff is going to make a big difference and probably even upwards of 10 to 12 wins. Yeah, I, I, I really do like them. And I actually I have the Pirates actually to um, finish second behind the Cardinals. The Pirates have I mean, the, the Pirates have scary pitching. I do that. I, I've always I worry about the Pirates a lot, too, because I keep thinking there's going to be that year that uh, Polanco takes off and becomes the Polanco that everybody thought he was going to be. You know, that's uh, that's that's kind of – their lineup could be really good. You know, the, uh, the one thing they're playing, they're going to play Gong at third every day, and then they're going to play a rookie shortstop. Um, that could ultimately hurt them, but they do have pitching. So I, I think they, And they have a hurdle, you know, which yeah. makes a big difference. I think they're going to be pretty good. Uh, with the Reds and everything, I mean, you've got Sonny Gray, Alex Wood. They're part of that rotation now. Uh, you still do have uh, – so is Tanner Roark, sorry. Uh, you still do have Luis Castillo who can go out and shut down a lineup. Oh, absolutely. Go out and, yeah. you know, allow 15 runs in three innings. Um, they're going to hit – you know, Yasiel Puig's going to hit third. Uh, he's going to protect Joey Votto today, or this year. Um, you're going to see a lot of Jesse Winker. Uh, who I like as a player. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's a guy that's that he's he's a guy that reminds me a lot of Charlie Blackman. He's a guy I that's going to put that. the ball over the wall. Um, he's not terribly fast, but he's going to uh, still steal bases for you. Um, and but he's not going to beat you by making mistakes. He's he's not going to get himself out a ton of times. Um, and he's going to hit the ball. He's going to hit the ball hard. Um, this outfield I think is is very talented and very I think it's getting looked over mm -hmm. because of what they can do but they have to perform it's it's also an outfield that could be completely re completely reworked by the middle of July as well sure yeah Sinzel's so. gonna work his way up somewhere yeah he's got to yeah so, and I was actually surprised when Scooter and Jeanette went down, they didn't put him at second base. You know what? I know that there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's some people that aren't incredibly happy about that. You know, the, uh, you know, they think about how lucky they are to put to luck into a, a Iglesias on a, uh, um, minor league deal. <laughs> yep. You know, yeah, it's crazy. It's... Uh, all right, let's, uh, close it out here with the national league West. Um, it's the Dodgers, it's the Rockies and Maybe it's the Diamondbacks, but eh. The, I think it's race to me. I mean, it's yeah, it's the Dodgers and the Rockies, and um, the Padres to me are in that in, kind of in the Toronto mold right now. Of yep. you're probably pretty close, but you got to wait for the kids to come up. Yeah, they could be scary good in th two or three years, but I, I still think they're that far away from even competing, really. Um, I think they would actually be a lot better if they traded Will Myers. I, I kind of thought that would happen. Yeah. I, yeah, I know that's a hot take, but he needs to go to an American League team because I don't know, like, he, you're hiding him in left field. But you yeah. can't hide him in left field in Chavez Ravine. You can't hide him in left field in Denver. Um, you can hide him in left field in Arizona or in San Diego. But the rest of those outfields, you can't. It's it's very hard. They tried the third base experiment last year, didn't work. You're not gonna you're not gonna take over Hosmer at first base. Um, like I I legit think because of the outfield depth that they they've kind of built, I think they would be better trading him and getting some pitching. Um, look, you're gonna have Lucchese and Lauer are going to lead this this rotation. They're young. They're 
unproven over the course of a, a full season, but they've got upside. Lucchese's not going to overpower anybody. He's kind of your Tyler Anderson-ish finesse type pitcher. Um, but like I, the only names I'm really afraid of, Manny Machado, Eric Hosmer. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Reyes is going to beat you. Myers is going to beat you every once in a while. Like Austin Hedges still has the ability to put the ball over the, um, the wall. The one kid I'm really excited to watch and see how he adjusts is uh, Urias. If he can hone the bat-to-ball skills on a consistent basis, then I think the combination of... I, I do honestly end up thinking he ends up taking over the leadoff spot by the end of the season. Yeah, that's yeah, how I mean, good well, I think he could be. Well, and that, at that point, aren't you probably looking at uh, uh, Tatis being up anyway? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and then so because I would assume Urias maybe even plays second at that point too. Yep, and that means that Ian's Kinsler, Ian Kinsler has been traded to a contender. Yeah, probably. So, probably. Uh, the Giants, their lineup is Buster Posey, Brandon Belt, Evan Longoria, Brandon Crawford, like old yeah i feel bad for him i mean i honestly it... yep i i really do um but those are the guys i mean you've you're steven duggar joe panic and mac williamson are your youngest guys but gerardo parr is going to be uh roaming around in that outfield and good glove not a consistent bat um bum is 30 going on 39 yeah it feels like sure. uh yeah, kind of like bluber Yep, their their best arm in this is Derek Rodriguez in the rotation. Um, I think Derek Rodriguez is evidently he's added two or three miles an hour to his fastball over the off season. Mm. Like I've got to see it. Yeah. But um, because I don't trust spring training guns, uh, I think they're juiced up a little bit. Sure. But um, he's got some talent. I mean, he's got a lot of talent. Obviously, he's got the, the genetics as well coming from his dad. Mm-hmm. So, um, but, okay, so the big two are the Dodgers and the Rockies. Uh, let's talk about the Diamondbacks here real quick. I think Zach Grinke is gone by the end of the season. Um, if the Yankees need a rotation guy, I think he goes there. Um, just because his... his Salary is so commanding. I don't think that this team competes um, a ton. I think they, it, I think their ceiling for them is competing for a wild card spot. Um, you know that second wild card spot, like, and and maybe, and that's only if like the rest of the National League kind of falters a little bit. Um, I think with the depth of the, uh, central and the East, if you don't win this division, Mm -hmm. you're not going to the playoffs unless, unless you're just that good. Like the only way I could see like two teams coming out of this division to the playoffs is if like, you're talking about 95 games for the Dodgers and the Rockies or the the top two teams, because I think it's going to take 93 to 95 wins to get a wild card spot or both wild card spots. Sure. Um, it's going to be a bloodbath. The National League will know that. Yep. Uh, but, I mean, Robbie Ray has to bounce back. Zach Godley has shown some promise. We know what Zach Grinke has been able to do reinventing themselves. Um, you've got some of your old guys, uh, Carson Kelly. Uh, I just – Outside of Peralta and Jake Lamb, like, this isn't a sexy lineup to me. Yeah, yeah. and you know, I I don't know why I've never been sold on Lamb anyway. Um, you see him a lot more than I do, so I don't know. But you're right. I, Like I said, I, I just feel like the Rockies and the Dodgers are so much better than anybody else in the division. 
Yeah, I, I would kind of agree with you. Um, let's talk about the Dodgers here real quick, then we'll close up with the Rockies. Um, okay, so they're going to do what they do, and they they play platoon baseball. You're going to see hockey line shifts um, mm-hmm. in the seventh inning based on matchups, and like it's not how I would play baseball, and I would hate to play baseball as a young kid in that type of system. But I guess it's better than not playing. But, yeah. You know, I don't think Max Muncy duplicates what he did last year. I, I just don't. I'm not. I think he had one of those seasons that is one for the ages. Yeah. I don't think that's who he is as a player. Okay. Yeah. Um. The question is, is how does Corey Seager um, respond from the Tommy John? Um, can Cody Bellinger rebound after last year? Like, I think they're going to be fine and they're going to compete. Um, Austin Barnes now has, uh, that he's got that catching job to himself now. Um, like there's a lot of, they did go out and they signed AJ Pollock, which I was hoping he would get out of the division, but <laughs> you know, cause he always kills us, but you know, so they've got that kind of locked down, um, but they don't have to worry about Puig anymore. They don't have to worry about Kemp. They've got some, you know, we get to watch these these young guys with the drillers and the um, the Dodgers in Oklahoma City. Their rotation is going to carry them. I see, I see them as a more talented Mets out West. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I can see where you're coming from with that, without a doubt. I mean, that's – and that's – you know, I'm trying to pull up their uh, roster resource page just to, to – uh, you know, because I <laughs> – you're right. I mean, that they utilize that 25-man roster better than anybody else. Um, yeah, I mean – it. I mean, you got an infield of Enrique Hernandez and Muncie. Mm-hmm. I mean, not overwhelming to me. I mean, I, I thought Hernandez had a big year last year. I mean, is that sustainable is as much as – is that is, is least likely to be sustainable? Is that more so than Muncie? I don't know. Um, I think it is because he's – I think he, he's he got the ability to play all over the diamond. Yeah. That's his strength. I mean, he can play second, short, first. He can, he can literally play everywhere except for, you know, in the battery. So I think that's his asset, and that's going to allow him to stay locked in a lot more. Um, but I mean, outside of three, four, five, or two, three, four, five, like Jock Peterson, he can get on base, he can hit the ball, but can he stay consistent? Um, and I mean, and you know, it's funny. It's I've never felt like they truly believed in Peterson after his. I don't think or, they did know, I heard they were trying to deal him, you know, during spring because they want Verdugo to play every day. You know, one of those situations. So, you know, we've, I, I don't, we've watched Verdugo and we know what he can yeah, do. Exactly. I'm surprised it's taken him this long to crack the lineup, to be honest with you. Oh, man. Well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So, um, you know, the, the Rich Hill, it's, it's always a question mark with him. <laughs> uh, Ryu, when he's healthy, oh, my gosh. Dude, he was. I think he was one of the best pitchers last six, eight weeks of the season last year. Yeah. Um, Their know, rotation's good. I mean, because I yeah. think Bueller's really good. Oh yeah, I I love Bueller, and you've got you know you've got Kershaw. That's if if I'm the Dodgers, I honestly I sit Kershaw out six for six weeks. Yeah. Like you don't need him in May. You don't or you don't need him in April. You don't need him until June. Like he is your prized possession. I understand everything, but you need him in October. So that's and that gives you a month to find out what Urias is. Oh yeah, and yeah, this is and that's a kid that you know, with all the hype, he just has not been able to stay healthy to put it together. Yeah. So all right, let's finish up with the Rockies and we'll get out of here. Um, the big question for me with the Rockies is not are they going to hit. Because we know that they are. The big question for me is: Is this can Freeland and Marquez 
even if they don't necessarily completely duplicate what they did last year, can they perform somewhat within that range of levels? Um, and then it's can John Gray bounce back? Yeah. That's that's those are my questions for the Rockies. Um, I wasn't particularly fond of the Daniel Murphy signing. I know what it does. Um, it allows you to move, put him at first. You get Ryan McMahon some time, um, who I think is going to be an absolute stud. And it gets uh, Ian Desmond off of first base. Um, you know, it moves Charlie to the uh, right field. And now you've got David Dolan left. Like, that's basically what your outside of Nolan and story, that's what your lineup's going to be. Sure. Um, they just dealt Tom Murphy to the Giants uh, after putting him on waivers. Um, so you've got Ionetta and Walters that are going to be your one-two behind the plate. But where all the rapport is with this young staff, the question is always going to be how do they sustain the level that they did in Coors Field? And... Can they get enough out of the back, the middle to the back end of the rotation if those two guys do perform to keep up with what the Dodgers can put out there when fully healthy? Sure, sure. I, I like the rotation. You know, uh, um, and I like black. I think the black, I think the black factor is huge. I mean, it's funny how the mindset has changed since he's been involved. Um, you know, so I think they're going to compete. You know, it's funny. You just kind of skimmed over him a little bit, but I know a lot of St. Louis and well, in in El Central riders who think David Dahl is going to be a monster. Oh, I love David Dahl this year. Like for my guys that are going to be listening to this and stuff, um, here in a couple of days they're going to hear hear me talk about David Dahl and Ryan McMahon. Mm-hmm. Like, because I I honestly think that if McMahon can show the ability to be serviceable against left-handed hitting or left-handed pitching, I absolutely think that this is his job to lose at second base. Um, and he can spell Daniel Murphy at first. Yeah. So I, he just, his swing looks locked in. He had another home run today. I, I just, David Dahl, I've, we've loved David Dahl for the last couple of years. It's just a health thing with him. Um, I do like, Obviously, the Daniel Murphy signing, I think, is nice. Um, it, it allows the roster to kind of maneuver a little bit in ways that it wasn't able to last year because you didn't have that first base guy. Uh, never thought that losing Mark Reynolds would hurt so much. Yeah. But it did. You notice they went out and they got him again. Um, and he's going to break uh, spring with the, camp, with the club. It, it's... And then you've got the two stalwarts. You got Trevor Story, who we've we watched both Trevor and Nolan here in yep. town. Um, you've got those two guys, and and those two guys are going to be, you know, the mainstays in that the center of the lineup. Uh, I'm interested to know and kind of see. We've never played well in Florida. We open up with seven games in Florida. I'm interested to see how that goes. Yeah. So. Wow. But um, Murphy's yeah. going to be Murphy's going to be he's going to go 40 plus doubles in Colorado, though. Yeah, that's yeah. the one he's, thing he can hit. Yep, he can hit. Um, and that's uh, that's going to be it's going to be very, very fun and interesting to watch. So um, I miss DJ. I'm going to miss DJ. But I I trust Braddock in what he's been doing. Sure. And after taking them to the playoffs, you know, for two years in a row. I, I have to trust him. Yeah, I agree. So. Completely agree with you. All right, man. Well, that's going to do it for us today. This was, like I said, just a preview of everything. Uh, we'll try to get on a couple times throughout the season, uh, break down some stuff if there's something going on with the or with the the Cardinals. Um, you know that we need to we need to touch on for my guys. Then cool. I'll try to see if I can get you uh, get you on at some point. Oh, I, I did. Yeah, I appreciate it. I had a lot of fun. So. Um, I know both of our wives are probably going, what in the heck? So uh, we'll get out of here. Uh, Alan, 
good talking to you again uh for myself for the dfs army we gone